How does Reformed theology help a Christian stay the course after receiving a terminal cancer diagnosis? If, um, if you were to try and define Reformed theology, the doctrine of the sovereignty of God or a robust doctrine of providence is at the heart of it. It's not all of it, but it's certainly at the heart of it. That nothing happens without God willing it to happen, that nothing happens without God willing it to happen before it happens, nothing happens without God willing it to happen in the way that it happens, and that, that covers everything. And I think that within that knowledge, whatever trial, whatever difficulty, um, a, a cancer diagnosis, this is not something arbitrary, it's not something whimsical, it's not something where the devil has won a minor battle against God. Um, all things work together for the good of those that love him. And I think the only comfort uh, in life and in death, I'm not heading in the direction of the Heidelberg Catechism, but, <laughs> but I mean, the only comfort when trial comes is, is the knowledge and certainty that God is in control. I, I may not understand why, as Job didn't understand why, and, and he was never told why. What he was told was that there is a reason and that God knows and that he needs to trust the Lord. And I, I, think, I think that only, only the Reformed faith can give you that stability when the ground opens up to swallow you. Um, when um, the Apostle Paul was given a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment him, we were never told what it was that he was given. And um, at first he pleaded with the Lord three times to take it away, so he had a good understanding of the sovereignty of God. Um, but the Lord didn't. His response was, my grace is sufficient for you. And then Paul seems to have a giant attitude change toward whatever the thorn was. Um, he says, therefore, I will gladly boast in infirmities and reproaches and persecutions and needs, distresses. See, it covers the whole gamut. For Christ's sake, for when I'm weak, then I'm strong. And I think that's one way of, of looking at things is that God is completely sovereign in what has happened, even though it was a messenger of Satan to torment him. Um, but even as Paul will later say in, in Philippians that uh, there's a certain anxieties that come over us, and I don't know of a greater anxiety that would be caused, uh, of course, by cancer that would cause such a great anxiety, but he says, and everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God, and he doesn't say the cancer will be taken away. But he does say God will do something. There's a promise embedded there that the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard, it's like a garrison, guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. So, you know, we see cancer walks and we see everyone say, I'm going to beat cancer. You're not going to beat cancer. God, God has a, a perfect plan, but he does promise to change perspective. And then we can live understanding that even this can be used for his glory. Yeah, there's a, a, an American heresy abroad. It's a very recent heresy, I think. And the American heresy is everyone's going to die except me. <laughs> so somehow I have a peculiar right, a distinctive right to be protected from cancer because everyone's going to die except me. And um, the awful truth I have for you today, the bad news I have for you today, is we're all going to die, including you. In maybe not me, but including all of you. <laughs> and um, how the Lord chooses to take us is in his providential control. Um, but however that happens, uh, the confidence that he's in control, that he has a good purpose, um, one of the first experiences I had when I came to this church 41 years ago was to visit a young mother dying of cancer. It's 
seems like yesterday. <laughs> and I don't know that I was any comfort to her, but she was great comfort to me. And I said, how can you go through this? And she said, I can go through it because I know this is God's purpose for me. And uh, that's what we need to believe. Are the Psalms primarily intended to be sung or prayed? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I think it's fair to say they're both the song book and the prayer book of God's people. And um, they, uh, they serve both of those purposes excellently. How should modern Christians approach fasting? <laughs> Carefully. <laughs> I, think, I think there are occasions when you have big decisions to make, life-changing decisions, where to uh, go without a meal or two so that you can devote yourself to prayer and meditation is a reasonable uh, conclusion to draw. Whether or not um, fasting is a mandated um, spiritual activity for every Christian in the New Testament, we, we can debate that. But I think all of us have in life major, major decisions that we have to make. And I, I think those should be made prayerfully and carefully and with a great deal of thought and uh, fasting enables you to do that. Um, I have not in my own life practiced regular fasting. Um, and we could debate as to how long of a fast. I, I knew of an elder one time who went without food uh, for 29 days, ended up in the ER. Uh, he was at death's door. I don't recommend that. Um, I, I, I suspect that when Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights that it wasn't I mean, he didn't fast from liquid. I'm, I'm pretty sure in his physical body, he would not be able to survive 40 days and 40 nights without liquid, without water. So, and I think that, I think that if you've never fasted before, I, I do think that you, sh you should seek out the advice of an older Christian before doing something that's a little bizarre. I would just add, if you're going to fast, nobody should know about it. So Jesus um, constantly condemned the showy religion of the Pharisees who prayed pompously and made their fasting known. And uh, that might check this whole discussion if um, we just keep it to ourselves. Can you explain why some Reformed Christians believe singing and corporate worship should be unaccompanied by music? Yes, I can. Would you? Is that on the card? Is that on the card? Are, are you allowed to just sort of sovereignly add things to the card? Yes. Um, in the history of the church, um, for it appears about the first thousand years of the history of the church, no musical instruments were used in public worship. These are just facts now. These are not uh, anything I'm recommending. I'm just reporting. These are just the facts. Tell me the facts, just the facts. Um, and that practice of the church for the first thousand years uh, is maintained to this day by the Eastern Orthodox churches. Uh, the Eastern Orthodox churches have no musical instruments in their services. So all the singing is a cappella. And um, th their historians have debated, how long an answer do you want? Um, 
It's a lightning round. Um, uh, um, historians have debated about why the church um, did not have musical instruments, and the, the simple answer seems to be that the synagogue did not have musical instruments when the church was started, and that the church, in its public worship, in many ways followed the practices of the synagogue, and so they pr followed that practice of the synagogue. That leads, of course, historians to ask, why did the synagogue not have musical instruments? And uh, the, the historians are somewhat divided on that. Um, some have argued that the synagogue never had musical instruments, and so it was just part of the life of the synagogue, not to have musical instruments. Others have argued that when the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, that the synagogue stopped having musical instruments as an act of mourning until the temple should be rebuilt. And in Orthodox Jewish synagogues to this day, no musical instruments are used. Now, when Calvin um, began the Reformation, uh, and in this he was in some ways following Zwingli, um, Calvin said, well, musical instruments, that's a newfangled innovation of the Roman church, only 500 years old. And so Calvin um, did not have musical instruments uh, in the churches, and most Reformed churches uh, did not have musical instruments in the 16th century. Uh, Zwingli doesn't entirely count because he didn't have singing either. So um, he said, uh, Ephesians just says you should sing in your heart. So there was no use of the mouth in Zurich. Um, Calvin did not agree with that. They sang in, in Geneva but without musical instruments. And I would say most uh, Reformed churches did not have musical instruments uh, till around the beginning of the 17th century. And uh, in the Dutch Reformed churches, that's when musical instruments started to come back in uh, to, to the uh, services. And uh, a little bit later, that began to happen in uh, Scotland as well. Um, and um, the Dutch Reformed church, tell me when this is enough. The Dutch Reformed church <laughs> had no splits in the 17th century, and therefore there was no... The Dutch Reformed church had no splits? <laughs> What? <laughs> the Dutch Reformed Church had no splits in the 17th century. It is a miracle. It's a miracle. The Dutch Reformed Church had no major split until 1834. Would you I'm like me to talk about that? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Um, I, I just wish that Dr. Spruill was here <laughs> to remind us of what Luther thought. Well, yes, if you want to be a Lutheran, you should ask what Luther thought. Um, so there, there was no continuing practice in Dutch reform circles of no musical instruments because there was no conservative breakaway gr group to continue that old practice. But amongst the Scottish Presbyterians, who seemed to split at the drop of a hat, um, <laughs> there were groups that continued to... Uh, um, follow that practice. And Calvin would have said, uh, there is no directive in the New Testament to use musical instruments in worship. So you just gave a great history lesson, but yeah, you, didn't, I did. you didn't tell us where you stand. See, I'm on home turf here, and I can, I can press him right now. You got, you got to give us, you know, what do you think of the organ? As Robert Dabney said, <laughs> no, no. As Robert Dabney said, the organ is a musical instrument uniquely designed to support the Roman Catholic system of theology. <laughs> I'll be in trouble with all my Dutch friends. <laughs> Dutch people love the organ. So um, I'm not saying where I stand on these issues. I'm just talking about what the New Testament says. I love John Calvin. I owe a great deal of my life to him. I spent years studying him. 
but I'm not sure I want to take musical advice from John Calvin. <laughs> and I rest my case. I, I agree with you 100%. I only want to take my musical advice from the Bible. <laughs> and I still haven't said what I believe. I do. That was a good question. Thank you. When did the Roman Catholic Church begin? That's history. <laughs> um, I think Luther and Melanchthon said it began around 600 with uh, Pope Gregory the Great, who was the, uh, how, how did they put that? The, um, the Pied Piper leading the church astray. Um, uh, the, the development of the Roman Catholic Church um, to where it is today is a very long process of often slow and subtle changes. And um, uh, the, 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 the church in Rome uh, for many centuries got many things right and provided valuable leadership uh, in the worldwide church. Um, but uh, gradually, it allowed its own traditions to have more authority than the Word of God, and those traditions then fed off traditions. That's often a problem in churches, that tradition heads authority rather than the Word of God. And um, so uh, it's, a, it's a kind of long story to talk about. Do you think that the seeds of the Roman Catholic Church lie in Augustine's doctrine of the church? I, I think by the time Augustine comes along, that Augustine comes along, um, <laughs> we don't want to be Augustine anglicized. Is a, Augustine is a city in Florida. <laughs> Sinclair Ferguson told me that Anglicanizing Englishmen say Augustine, and proper Scottish Presbyterians say Augustine, and um, uh, the Latin word is Augustinus, so it seems like Augustinus is, anyway, doesn't really matter. Um, I, I think uh, by Augustine's day in the early fifth century, there are already significant seeds of a Romanizing ecclesiology. But most of that Augustine inherited rather than created. And uh, it, you see from the beginning that um, uh, Augustine in what he has inherited has this tension between what will later become Roman Catholicism and what will later become Protestantism because you can almost argue that the Protestants follow part of Augustine and make it more consistent, and Roman Catholics follow another part of Augustine and make it more consistent. Wasn't it B.B. Uh, Warfield who said the triumph of Augustine's doctrine of grace over his doctrine of the church? Yes. 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 I attend a church where the Bible teaching is sound and the pastors are caring but we sing songs produced by megachurches that are known for their dubious teaching. I'm conflicted on whether we should sing their songs. Do you have any advice? You should be good on this. I should. Um, so I, I think uh, that's a conscience issue. Um, the last thing we want to do is sing heresy back to the Lord. The last thing we want to do is sing falsehood. Um, we, do, we should have a measure of trust in our leadership to oversee the music that is being sung. And you, the problem today is that typically it's the worship team or the, in this model is what I'm assuming, it's often the worship team, sometimes the pastor, and these things have no checks at all. And I think that's incredibly harmful to the entire congregation. I know in our our church order um, for the United Reformed Churches, we are to sing, we are to sing principally the Psalms, pr principally. Um, Which is probably more than 40% of the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
and hymns that are approved um, by the consistory. So I, I think um, the way to handle that would be is, I, I personally could not sing air back to the Lord. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't do that. The hard part is, oftentimes when you're singing and the music's right in front of you, you, you have to process, what am I saying? And, and that comes with issues of trust in the leadership. So I think my approach would be is to talk to the leadership, especially if there's a statement of faith, and be a good Berean um, with the music that you sing. Is it in accord with scripture and is it truth? And express that kindly to your leadership um, and have them oversee that in a way that um, is helpful to the entire congregation. But I think that question kind of exposes what happens often in modern worship, that there's no oversight of what's being done. Yeah, I remember attending a theology conference, not a Ligonier conference, uh, many years ago, and it was about the importance of theology and having your theology straight. And one of the songs we thank had the refrain, Father, you are God alone, and we know you through your Son. And I said, that's pure Arianism. That's a denial of the divinity of the Son. If the Father is God alone, then the Son can't be God. And as a matter of conscience, I couldn't sing that. Um, I agree with you. I think, by and large, we should trust the leadership of our churches, and unless there's an overwhelming reason to refuse to follow the leadership, namely that they're asking you to sing heresy. Um, but yeah, you, you, you know, one of the things that strikes me in reading the New Testament is that uh, Paul and Peter, when they write to churches, they assume that every individual Christian has a responsibility to listen to this letter and believe it and follow it out. And, and we all have a responsibility. We can't just hand our responsibility over to somebody else. What do you think of the current state of the Western church? Where do you see it heading in the next few years? Does that mean the California church? West <laughs> I personally think that um, the church in the West generally, but particularly in the United States, in the last 50 years has declined sadly and almost tragically. And um, uh, that's part of why I'm so enthusiastic about Ligonier Ministry, because I think it's providing theological resources to try to help the church regain some balance and insight and knowledge. Um, we are uh, a church that in the last 50 years has become, I think, far less knowledgeable. Uh, think of all of the evangelical churches there used to be in America um, with a range of theologies, but all committed to really knowing the Bible, memorizing the Bible. Uh, um, my wife grew up in a, in a Hungarian Baptist church where they had sword drills. How many people know what a sword drill is? See, you don't even know what a sword drill is anymore. It was, it was testing of Bible knowledge. And uh, the, the Bible is the Word of God, which is the Spirit of the Lord, and the Sword of the Lord. And uh, so they were really tested. People really knew the Bible. And I think Bible knowledge has sadly declined in our churches in the last 50 years? Um, a couple of things. First of all, uh, in the 26 years that I've been in the United States, um, I, I've just seen a huge shift, even among, I mean, you say the Western church, but even among reformed churches, um, there has been an accommodation a cultural accommodation, wanting to address all of the current cultural issues and being sensitive to <coughs> A, B, and C, whatever that may be. And I, and I think that when you take your eye, and, and this may sound simplistic, but when you take your eye uh, off of the gospel and consecutive expository preaching, um, the church is doomed to adopt the surrounding culture. The second thing I would say is that there is no guarantee or promise that the Western church is always going to be in the ascendancy. And you've just told us that the church is in the ascendancy in Africa. And maybe within our lifetime, and certainly within the lifetime of those who are younger than me, 
um, the center of the Reformed Church may be a completely different part of the world. And, and uh, that will be entirely uh, God's providence, but it'll also be a judgment on um, the Western Church. And, and, I, and I, I really only know the Reformed Church uh, for its cultural accommodations. I think that's exactly right about what's happening um, with cultural accommodation. And we have a series of movements and competing agendas in the culture that are bearing down on us. And um, all of these are vying for influence and power. And that's what the culture is telling us are the most, I mean, this is what you said in the, in the talk today. All of these are telling us these are the most important issues. And the question is whether the church is going to listen to that or listen to the word of God. And um, if the church remains faithful to the gospel and the mission of the church, which is to preach Christ and him crucified, to make the way known to the ends of the earth of salvation, I think those churches, have we come to a day of Amos 8 <laughs> where um, um, men will run to and fro seeking for the word of God and shall not find it, hearing of the word? I think that's gonna be more characteristic of our times. I think, believe God will preserve his church and there will be faithful expressions um, in churches in our, in, our, in our regions. People are gonna to have to drive. Um, it's, going, it's going to be, um, we see this in Southern California a lot. There's so much church burnout right now because people come to church and they're browbeaten with all the troubles they hear on Fox News and CNN all day. Who wants that in church? I guess some, but, but the leadership seems to think that's what people want, but it's not what they need. And so um, I think you're going to see this. There's gonna be a lot of accommodation to these things. It's happening right now. Um, but I, I do think the Lord will preserve his church, but those churches that continue to preach the word, hasn't God proven this with the mainline churches that have gone theologically liberal? They're emptying out right now. But what churches are full? So the churches that are taking serious, have a serious faith and a serious trust in God's word. And I, I do believe you'll see that. An, an interesting essay to read in this regard is uh, the last lecture that Abraham Kuyper gave at Princeton University towards the end of the 19th century. And uh, it was a series of lectures on Calvinism in various relationships. And the last lecture was Calvinism and the Future. And uh, Abraham Kuyper, who was a great uh, uh, theologian in the Netherlands, had been invited by B.B. Warfield to give lectures at Princeton University, uh, which he did. And uh, so Kuyper was reflecting as a late 19th century man on what's happening in the history of the church. Where is the church going? What does the future hold? And he said it seemed to him, and I'm not saying he's accurately prophetic in this regard, but it's kind of interesting. He said it seems to him that uh, the church has been spreading following the track of the sun around the world. So it started in the Near East, and then it moved to Greece, and then it moved to Italy, and then it moved to Northern Europe, and then it was powerful in Britain. And in the late 19th century, he said, I think there's evidences that uh, the center of the church is leaving Europe and is going to be found in America. He may have been pandering to the crowd a little bit, um, but it's sort of been true that uh, in a lot of the 20th century, the, the American church has been very powerful. And then he said, uh, I anticipate that in days to come, uh, the center of the church will move to Asia. And um, uh, now, he, he proved that he wasn't really a prophet. He didn't claim to be a prophet. But he proved not to be really a prophet since he thought the, the key place where the gospel would probably prosper was Japan. Not yet. Maybe, but not yet. Uh, but certainly, what we have seen of the spread of the gospel in Korea and in China has been very, very encouraging. Ligonier has on its docket a Chinese study Bible, and um, all we need is money. <laughs> well, we need other things too, but. Um, 
But, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of intriguing to see, can we trace the hand of God in history? I don't think we can with certainty. But um, uh, when we look at the whole history of the church, certainly the powerful centers of the church have moved from place to place over time and will most likely continue to do so. How should we approach the progressive Christian community when they do not have a faithful, exegetical approach to the scriptures? Did you say the community? The yeah, how should we approach the progressive Christian community when they do not have a faithful, exegetical approach to the scriptures? I didn't realize how tired I'd be after uh, speaking for Ligonier. I don't know how these old guys do it. So. <laughs> Youngsters are such wimps. <laughs> you know, I, I keep thinking back of the old ministers in the Dutch Reformed tradition who, you know, would um, uh, preach to 1,200 people and do all the catechizing of the young and print the bulletins and uh, never had any relief in the pulpit. And they were tough <laughs> and died young. Um, <laughs> Was there a question? There was <laughs> I, I think we have to distinguish various groups. We have to be careful about lumping everybody together. Uh, what does it mean to be a progressive Christian? Um, there are progressives and progressives. Uh, if there are progressives who really claim to read the Bible and believe the Bible, then we ought to sit down with them and go through the Bible. Um, but if there are progressives who say, you know, the only way forward is to dump parts of the Bible, then I think we have to speak quite sharply to those people about the dangerous road on which they find themselves and the dangers in which they're putting the souls of others. So um, you have to distinguish, I think, uh, error from error and uh, uh, deal somewhat differently depending on the severity of the error. I'm too old to answer this. <laughs> too smart. <laughs> At what point is it appropriate to leave your church? Um, that should come with a lot of prayer. We have a lot of church jumping today. That should come with a lot of prayer, great conviction, and doing your best to work with the leadership if there are severe compromises to the ministry of the word and the gospel and what a church is called to do and to be. Historically, we say there's three marks of a faithful and true church, the pure preaching of the gospel, the right administration of the sacraments, and church discipline. And I think um, those are good gauges by which to look at your church and say, are these things, are these things taken seriously in the church? Is, is the ministry centered on making known the gospel, preaching Christ, expositing the scriptures, working carefully, I believe, through books of the Bible, and um, faithfully administering the sacraments, and being willing and loving you enough to discipline you if, if, if you're in serious sin. And um, if, if those things are set aside, and we have little ones we're, we're raising, <laughs> and we have our own souls to care for, and also our families. And I see a lot of people who are more tied to friendships and culture and family uh, than the truth of the gospel. And I think um, this is where we have to be willing to count the cost and be willing to say, uh, are, we, are, we, are we involved in something that is, has a sincere concern to advance the truth as it is in Jesus? And if not, if I've come to that conscious conviction that that is not the case after prayer, working with my family, and spending serious time talking to the leadership, then I think it's entirely appropriate to look for uh, a faithful church that demonstrates those, those historic marks. I don't think that there's a one-size-fits-all answer to this question because there are multiple circumstances which make the answer different f for different people. But as an example, in 
and COVID season, you know, and that's a thing now, COVID season, um, we went online, we were always online, we'd been online for 20 years, but, but people, people joined us online uh, and some of them were near and some of them were far away, but those who were near came to me and said something like this, that we, we haven't heard preaching like this in years. And, and what they meant by preaching like this was not they, they had a grasp of Reformed theology. What, what they meant was, we haven't heard gospel preaching in years. So they'd been members of churches that had drifted away slowly, perhaps imperceptibly, and they, they hadn't realized what had happened. And, and what they heard was, we don't need to be in this church anymore because this church has abandoned the gospel. And in those sort of circumstances, you know, we said, come, we welcome you. Um, but, but there are obviously circumstances for some people where to stay and to try and reform that church might be a possibility. And that would depend on who that person is and, and, and who else is involved. Does it involve his wife? Does it involve his children? Uh, is he prepared to sacrifice gospel preaching to his children for the sake of trying to save a church that's drifted from the faith? You know, so, so the, there's no one size fits all uh, for this, but it's a, it's a very, very, very important question. And life is short. And, and, and I think for most people, the answer is you need to be in a church where the gospel is preached and your children are being ministered to in biblical and scriptural ways, particularly in the woke society that we're in. If a woman is under the authority of the elders, is it permissible for her to speak to the congregation on Sunday? Something with Amy Simple McPherson might be helpful. Right? <laughs> Amy said she knew that the Lord didn't want women to preach, but he told her she needed to preach. <laughs> um, well, Part, a part of this question rests on what you mean by speaks, I think. Um, if, I, I think it's fine for a woman to stand up in front of the congregation before the church service and make an announcement. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but if the, if the intention of the question is to talk about um, authoritative teaching and preaching in the, in the worship service of the congregation, then... Uh, no, it's not appropriate to be done. And if the elders say there, that she may do that, there's something wrong with the elders. Um, so uh, we, it's not that women cannot preach. It's that women ought not to preach. Um, Jay Adams, in his inimitable way, gave the illustration of that when he said, um, women can have children, but unless they're married, they ought not to. Uh, there's a difference between an ability to do something and an oughtness about that. And uh, so, um, you know, in, in a more sociological vein, uh, we can observe that in lots of American churches, I grew up in one, a Methodist church, um, the men all left because the women had taken over, or maybe the women took over because the men had all left, but in any case, uh, there's a great danger that a church becomes feminized. And uh, one of the most important things that women can do and need to do is to say to the men they have to fulfill their responsibilities. And um, that's when the church will flourish, I think. Thank you, gentlemen. Would you thank our panelists this afternoon?